Hi everyone, this is Miss Psilos, and today I'm going to be teaching you about DNA structure and DNA replication. We're going to answer three questions today. First, what's the point of DNA? Second, what's the structure of DNA? And third, how is DNA replicated? During the lecture, you'll be taking detailed handwritten notes, and you might want to draw some diagrams. If you need to, take a look at the note template to guide you on which notes to write down. During the lecture, you can always write down more than what the, the template suggests, and you can pause the video whenever you need to. So first, what's the point of DNA? DNA is like the reference book for how to make every cell in your body. In every cell, there's a giant set of DNA strands that are held together within the nucleus. So we call these really long strands a chromosome. And altogether, humans have 46 chromosomes in each cell, except for your sex cells, the sperm and egg cells. But we'll get to that in a few weeks. Just like chapters in a reference book, different sections of your DNA contain different instructions. There's instructions for how to be a nerve cell, instructions for how to be a skin cell, and even how to make the pigment, the pigment melanin. Melanin gives your skin its color. Although each cell holds the entire encyclopedia of you in all 46 chromosomes, in each cell, it only reads the sections of the DNA that give the specific instructions that cell needs to do its job. So a heart cell just ignores the instructions about how to be a liver cell. In a later lesson called protein synthesis, we'll discuss how cells determine what instructions to look at and how exactly they read and follow those instructions. For today, we're just talking about how the structure of DNA allows it to store information. And we'll talk about how DNA is replicated or copied so that none of the instructions are lost. So we're on to question two. What is the structure of DNA? And the first thing to note is its name. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And the three key letters of deoxyribonucleic acid that form the acronym DNA are underlined. Yes, you need to be able to pronounce it and spell it later on. One more time. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Feel free to practice that term out loud right now. Deoxyribonucleic acid. So, DNA is a long string-like molecule made of two strands connected together by rungs in the center. And that's twisted into what's called a double helix. You're going to see many different representations of DNA today. This is the most accurate one, the twisted ladder, or the double helix shape on the left. However, this twisted ladder form is actually really hard to read. So to read it better, we untwist the DNA to see the details of its structure. By the way, when I say double helix, here's what I mean. You can see a single helix here in the green. It's one coil, and then a double helix would be to the right, what we see on the right, that has both the blue and the green strands. These two strands are coiled together or are twisting with each other. But most of the time when we're looking at models of DNA, we'll look at the untwisted ladder model. Looking at the model on the right, we can see the backbone of the ladder, the gray stripes going up and down, and we can also see the middle of the ladder, what we call the rungs of the ladder, that has different colored pieces. They're colored so that we can tell the differences between them. Do you notice that there's two colors that make up each rung? That'll be relevant momentarily. Here's another DNA model. This one shows the structure in a more specific way. We see the atoms that build the DNA and how pieces connect together. The sides of the ladder are the pieces that go up and down. The rungs of the ladder are the pieces that stretch horizontally into, into the center of the DNA. The sides of the DNA, the backbones, are made of alternating phosphate groups, these yellow things, and deoxyribose sugars, these blue pentagons. We're going to talk about each. So the phosphate group, the yellow piece that I've circled, is made of one phosphorus atom and four oxygen atoms. What does that together make? 
it makes something called a phosphate group, PO4. PO4 means one phosphate atom connected to four oxygen atoms. The deoxyribose sugars, the blue pentagons, are made of five carbon atoms, 10 hydrogen atoms, and four oxygen atoms. Now, you don't actually need to memorize or know either of these chemical formulas. This is just to remind you that we can talk about the molecular structures that are composed of atoms bonded together. We can re represent these groups in different ways. We can be really specific or more simplified. And to simplify things, we could just represent the phosphate group as a little circle and the deoxyribose as a pentagon. Just make sure you keep in mind that both of these parts are made of multiple atoms connected together. And they're connected by a particular type of bond. And that bond is called a covalent bond. This is something you do need to know. Within the phosphate group and within the deoxyribose sugar, there are covalent bonds. And in this image, they're represented by solid lines connecting the atoms together. And we also see covalent bonds connecting the phosphate group to the sugar. So you should see a solid line connecting the yellow phosphate group to the blue pentagon. These are strong covalent bonds. You can think about these types of bonds as the equivalent of a knot tying two ropes together. They take some effort and energy to make, and they're pretty strong, so that means they're pretty difficult to break. If you pulled two ropes that were tied together, you probably wouldn't be able to pull them apart easily. Now let's look at the center of the DNA, what we call the rungs of the ladder earlier. The rungs are the horizontal pieces that stretch along the inside of the ladder. These are where the information is stored in DNA. That might be easy to see because if we look at the backbone again, the sides of the ladder, they're all exactly the same. We see a phosphate group, a sugar, another phosphate, a sugar, a phosphate, a sugar, over and over and over again. There's no difference whether we go up or down the molecule of the DNA. So there's no information stored there. The differences, the code, are all in the center region. Each of these parts of the DNA, where you see the letters inside, they're called nitrogen bases. Notice that there are always two nitrogen ba bases facing each other and connecting to each other. What are these nitrogen bases made of? Well, from the name, we can infer that they have nitrogen in them. There are four kinds of nitrogen bases, unlike the backbone, where there's only one type of sugar and one type of phosphate group. There's four different kinds of nitrogen bases, and they are adenine, which we abbreviate with an A, thymine, which we abbreviate with a T, guanine, which we abbreviate with a G, and cytosine, which we abbreviate with a C. Listen to my pronunciation because you'll need to say these names out loud later. The nitrogen bases consist of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Each nitrogen base is always attached to the deoxyribose sugar. So take a look, we have an adenine here and it is connecting covalently right there to the deoxyribose sugar. They are never attached to the phosphate group. That'll be important. You'll need to understand the structure. And this is true on both sides of the DNA, that the nitrogen bases are always attached to the sugar. Each rung of the ladder always has two bases paired together, and they're always paired together in a particular way, according to what we call a base pair rule. This rule is called the complementary base pair rule. Adenine always pairs with thymine, and cytosine always pairs with guanine. So A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. We say that adenine is the complementary base to thymine. So they're called complementary base pairs. The same thing could be said about guanine and cytosine. 
they are complementary base pairs. Now take a look at the bonds that are holding the nitrogen bases together in the middle. They're weak. These are called hydrogen bonds. Can you see the difference between a covalent bond and a hydrogen bond? The way in which they're depicted in the diagram, covalent bonds are represented by a solid line, while hydrogen bonds are represented by a dotted line. Hydrogen bonds are actually not physical connections between atoms. They're just attractions, like magnets. Hydrogen bonds can hold these bases close together, but only weakly. If you pull the bases away from each other, they would easily come apart. And so you can already start imagining that the side of the DNA molecule, one side, and the other side are just held together by magnets. And you would be able to pull each side of the DNA away from each other pretty easily. That'll become relevant later on in this lecture. So now let's take a look at how we actually assemble one of these DNA molecules. Something that's important to know are that there are some free floating DNA pieces that are always found in a cell. Again, I mentioned that you're going to see many different representations of DNA in this lecture. Here's another representation of the pieces that make up DNA. These pieces of DNA, the phosphate groups, the deoxyribose sugars, and the nitrogen bases are freely floating in the cell, waiting to be connected into new parts of DNA. But they're usually not alone like this. Let me hide this. I think it's blocking you. These parts usually exist connected together in a trio of one phosphate group, one deoxyribose sugar, and one nitrogen base. All three of these parts connected together creates a nucleotide. So there you go. Here I'm circling just one nucleotide. And in that nucleotide, there's one phosphate group, one sugar, and one nitrogen base. And one thing to keep in mind, in the past you've heard the term monomer and polymer before. A nucleotide is the monomer of the DNA polymer. All of these nucleotides that you see on the screen, these are all monomers, each one, and they can be connected together to build a whole piece of DNA. That means the nucleotide is the building block of the larger DNA polymer. Sometimes I, re I might refer to just a guanine base, which is just this orange part here alone on the left. Or sometimes I might refer to a guanine nucleotide, which consists of the trio of parts connected together, a phosphate group, a deoxyribose sugar, and the nitrogen base all together. So listen carefully to what I say over the next couple days when we refer to a guanine nucleotide or an adenine nucleotide. We're referring to the whole set. And if I refer to a guanine base, that means I'm just referring to this part of the nucleotide. So let's build some DNA. We've got these freely floating nucleotides in the cell. Let's assemble them into a DNA molecule, and you can probably infer how we're gonna do this. So we'll start by building one side of the DNA. First, I have a guanine nucleotide. I'll connect that to a cytosine nucleotide, and then I'll connect that to an adenine nucleotide. That's only half the DNA. It's just one side of our double helix. Now we need the other side. For the right side, I'm gonna start at the top. What pairs with adenine? Well, according to our base pair rule, adenine pairs with thymine. What's gonna connect next? We see a cytosine on the left side, so that means guanine must pair to the right of it. For the third, we see guanine on the left side, so that means cytosine must pair on the right. Boom, there we go, a full piece of DNA with two strands connected together. We could represent these strands in a couple different ways. We could represent it like what you see on the left, where we have all the details of the different shapes of the nucleotide components based on their molecular structure, but we could also simplify that same DNA and show it like this on the right, where we flatten everything out and get rid of the shapes. It could just look like a flat ladder. This would be the same DNA molecule. Notice how we've got adenine, cytosine, guanine on the left, 
and thymine guanine cytosine on the right. That's the same model as the one that we have on the left. It's representing the same information. We could simplify that even further where we don't even draw the backbone at all. We could just write the letters of the bases. As we go down each side, ACG on the left, TGC on the right shows the same information as before. So there's multiple ways of representing the DNA structure. And what's awesome is that if you only see one half of the DNA molecule, you can automatically infer its complementary strand. Like that. We just need to remember what bases pair together. A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about how DNA is replicated. And let's start by talking about why DNA is replicated. You already learned that during S phase of the cell cycle, which is after the cell has already created new organelles and has grown a bit during G1, after that, the cell needs to make a copy of its DNA. One copy of the DNA, sorry there, one copy of the DNA will go to one of the daughter cells and the other copy of the DNA will go on to the second daughter cell. Both copies need to be identical so that the daughter cells both have the exact same set of instructions. And one last time, remind yourself of what DNA separation looks like and how the daughter cells end up with their own sets of DNA. By the time G2 rolls around, there should be two sets of DNA already made, and all the organelles should also have been copied by then. We can see in this diagram that each set of DNA gets separated and sent to opposite sides of the cell. The cell then pinches in the middle, and eventually we have two daughter cells that each have their own set of DNA. So it's really important that those two sets of DNA are identical. So now I'm going to zoom in on that process and show you exactly how one set of DNA is copied into two sets. Okay, so here we have yet another representation of DNA. You can see the sugar phosphate backbone on each side, and you can also see that the bases are paired in the middle. You should notice that they've been set up so that you can visually see that A always bonds with T like two pe puzzle pieces fitting together. And C always pairs with G. Again, two puzzle pieces fitting together. Next, we're going to write down the steps of DNA replication. How does the DNA get copied? Step one, the first, DN uh, first the DNA is untwisted and the weak hydrogen bonds between the bases are broken. This is done by an enzyme named helicase. An enzyme, remember, is a protein that can break or build chemical bonds. And we can watch helicase zoom through and split open the two strands of the DNA. It's able to do that because the bonds that hold these two strands together are weak hydrogen bonds, which Remember, those are like magnets, so you can easily pull them apart. So helicase does just that. Step two, the two strands are separated and free nucleotides that are floating around the cell start to move towards the unpaired or exposed bases on each strand. Step three, Another enzyme called DNA polymerase will use the complementary base pair rule to attach free nucleotides, the ones that are floating around, to create a new complementary uh, strand of DNA. Watch what it does as it clicks through. DNA will make the covalent bonds that connect each nucleotide together along the sugar phosphate backbone. Let me back that up and redo that so you can see what I mean. So for example, DNA polymerase will attach a cytosine to the first thymine, right there, what I just showed right there. And they're attaching to each other with a covalent bond. The hydrogen bonds in the center of the DNA will establish automatically, meaning that the hydrogen bond between this cytosine and this guanine should automatically form. Remember, think of hydrogen bonds like magnets. 
they form on their own, just like two magnets snapping together if they're close enough. The covalent bonds on the backbone, though, need to intentionally be connected by an enzyme. So DNA polymerase will do just that. One interesting thing about DNA polymerase, as it's walking down the strand connecting the nucleotides together, it may make mistakes. It's not perfect. It actually makes mistakes all the time, but it has a proofreading mechanism built into it so that it can catch its own mistakes. Some mistakes aren't caught, though, while some are. So the mistakes that stay in, they're called mutations, and I'll show you that process in a moment. One more thing to keep in mind. As you can see, DNA replication is happening on both of the open strands of the DNA at the same time. And this is going to be happening to all 46 chromosomes that are in the cell. All right. So at the end, you should have two sets of identical DNA molecules. And one thing to notice about these DNA molecules is what they're composed of. I've highlighted the two strands that are from the original DNA molecule. And now I'm highlighting the two new strands that were just built. These are called complementary strands. So we have the original strands that were just separated or pulled apart, and we have the new complementary strands that DNA polymerase just built using the free nucleotides from the cell. This whole process is called semi-conservative. And it means that the new DNA copies are composed of half the original strands and half new strands. So finally, oops, sorry. So finally, we've made our two sets of DNA. They're identical. And one of those copies will be given to one daughter cell during mitosis. And the other copy will go to the second daughter cell. But as I mentioned earlier, Sometimes DNA polymerase makes mistakes when it's creating new DNA strands. Watch as the DNA polymerase travels down the strand. Nope. Something wrong has happened. Instead of pairing a cytosine to this guanine, a thymine was accidentally paired. You can see that those two just don't fit together. It's a mismatch. Replication is finished without catching and fixing this mismatch. So your cells usually correct this mistake. And remember, those mismatches should be corrected during the G2 checkpoint. But if your cells don't fix this error and it remains, it becomes a mutation. Sometimes your cells don't actually know how to fix this error. They just see a mismatch, but they don't know which is the correct letter to keep and which is the letter that should be removed. They don't know if the thymine is correct or the guanine is correct. You and I can look at the other strand and we know that the guanine should be there. It was there originally and it should be paired with a cytosine, but cells can't do that all the time. Instead, the other fix will be made, meaning instead of keeping the guanine and adding a cytosine, they keep the thymine and replace the guanine with an adenine. Like that. See? Like that. Now if we look at the two strands, there's a difference between them in one spot. Everywhere else, they're exactly the same except for this base pair right here on this copy. This is actually what a mutation is. This is a change in the DNA, and this is how it happens in this situation. If there's a mutation made on one strand, the daughter strand, <laughs> sorry, my cat, the daughter strand that inherits this one will have mutated DNA. The daughter cell will possess slightly different sets of DNA. <laughs> so, that's, <laughs> so that's how a mutation ends up getting created and passed on to one set of daughter cells. Alrighty, <laughs> we're done. Thanks for watching this recording and I'll see you guys in class.